I think we begin by using the words of How Great Thou Art as our opening hymn.
Let's pray. Father, we acknowledge that we come before a great God. We come before the Almighty, and yet he's the one who spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. Father, we give you praise for that wonderful act of pure love, for that gracious and merciful act that we might be saved. Oh, Father, we give you praise for such a Savior as Jesus. And as we come into your presence, we come in his name and we come through his work. We come, Lord, to worship you, come to bring you our praise, and we truly mean how great thou art. Our souls do sing how great thou art. Lord, may that not just be our song this morning, but may that be our waking thought every day you give us breath. Lord, we come also to thank you for answered prayer. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for helping us on the journey of life. Thank you that you're ever near if we draw near to you. Lord, we also come to ask, and there are many things that we would lay before you today. And as we ask, we do so believing that we come to the God who is so great that nothing is impossible for him. And therefore, we have faith to ask. We dare to ask. We come boldly this morning. And we ask that you will help us in this meeting. But come by your power and upon your word, may it touch hearts and lives. May there be something for each one here. And may it come alive to us this morning. We ask, O God, that you'll bless all gathered in. You know the problems that people face. You know the the journey that they're on at this moment. You know if they're going through a dark tunnel or if they're on a mountaintop, you know. And we pray, dear Father, that our time together here will be an edifying time, a strengthening time, a time when people are built up in the Lord. Come by your Spirit and work mightily, we pray. Lord, we also come to you and ask for others. We want to bear one another's burden. We want to come and intercede. And we remember Uh, So many in our fellowship who have had falls recently and they have been in hospital and some are at at home. We think of our our sister Sarah over there in Manchester. And Lord, we think of Mrs. Kernahan as well. And Lord, we think of Ina. And we think of Billy Mooney. They've all had falls so recently. And we just pray for your healing hand to be upon each one of them. We thank you that Claire Gray's home from hospital. Again, Lord, be very near to Claire and Irene in the home. And Lord, there are so many others, and uh, we want to remember them collectively, but you know where they are, especially those who can no longer come and be part of the meetings here. Bless them, we pray. Lord, we also remember those who are grieving the loss of loved ones. We continue to remember the Flanagan family and uphold them before you. We think of the Duggan family as well and ask that your comfort will be real and your presence will be a felt reality. Lord, we also pray that the work and uh, different departments and ministries of this fellowship will know great blessing. We thank you for Open Door beginning again on Thursday night. And uh, Lord, for those who plan to come and for all that will happen, may your blessing be upon it. Our fellowship, our conversation and what we hear Lord, may it be one of those times when we go away saying, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Bless, we ask. Lord, the ongoing ministries and all the work that all the different leaders and helpers put in, may it be accompanied by your power. And may we see wonderful things happen to the glory of your name. Lord, we don't just ask this for ourselves. We think of the churches that surround us and those who are being faithful to you. We pray that they likewise will know your blessing and that this area will have lights that will shine brightly and point to Jesus. Lord, we again pray for our world and you know the events that are happening. You know how fast-paced politics can be. And Lord, we don't understand the most of it, but we know the one who does understand. We know the one who can do what the politicians and world leaders can't. 
And we know the one who has said that certain things will come to pass. And we trust you, Lord. And we're glad that we know that it ends triumphantly for Jesus. But in the meantime, we pray that we might see evidence of your power at work in those who have the rule over us. Lord, thank you for the children and young people you've blessed us with. And may they early in life realize their need of you and that they might come and fully, completely trust you and know what it is to be right with you. So bless us, we ask, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, we've been having a wee chat about the highway code, and uh, you'll be getting ready to drive soon any of these days. And uh, we had been thinking about going along the road, and I'm, I wonder, are you paying a wee bit more attention now that when you are passengers, are you? Maybe I should ask that to the drivers. Are you paying a wee bit more attention? I hope so. Uh, but all roads are not like that nice one there. And we share our roads with others. Yes, other people, other sizes of types of vehicles, and even animals. And remember, we thought of that sign, the sheep. And we reminded ourselves of what the Bible teaches us, that we are like sheep, and sheep are the kind of animal, if they're going to be an animal that will get lost or stray, it will be a sheep. And the Bible says we're just like that. We are not where we should be with God. We are away from him, and he comes looking for us. That was a wonderful thing we learned. Then last week, that was the what sign? Brilliant. For that wee child that said that. A no entry sign. And of course, we have to be honest and face up to what the Bible teaches that we can't get into heaven with our sin. Nothing that defiles will get in. So there is a no entry sign in heaven. But then, along with that, we have the wonderful words of Jesus when he said, I am the way. And we can come to God and be in heaven because of him. We we'll have another one here this morning, and can anybody guess what it might be? No? There's that many, that's not right. There's so many signs to choose from, it'll be hard to pick one. Well, here's the one that I have picked. There you are. Now, what do you think that means? Any? Yes, Alice? Can't hear you? Roadworks, yes, roadworks ahead. It's the triangle, which means it's a warning sign, and it's saying, warning, there's roadworks up ahead. And there's a man breaking his back. I don't know what he's shoveling, but he looks as if he's working really hard. And of course, all the workmen that we see in the roads are exactly like that. You have never see them leaning on a spade or anything <laughs> like that, or, or on their phones. They're all like, exactly, that's a brilliant picture. It's almost a photograph of all the workmen who work on the roads. Uh, well, we had plumbing works going on outside there a couple of Sundays ago, and that nearly put a stop to our baptismal service, so we know what it's all about. Road works, and the roads can get into bad shape, and we need to have them repaired. And they seem to pick their days, don't they? The day that you're in a hurry, or the day that you're going somewhere you don't know the way to, and you've been on Google Maps and you've sorted out the directions and then you come up to this great big yellow sign, Diversion. And then you're sent completely off track and uh, you're going by faith and fumes then until you reach your destination. Well, uh, who here likes hard work? <laughs> Alice, we'll remember that. That's great, a good, good ethic there. None of the rest of you know, <laughs> that's okay. Well, some of us want to do everything ourselves, and then others would just rather pay folk to come in and do it. If you do it yourself, listen carefully, if you do it yourself, what's it called? <laughs> You're not listening. If you do it yourself, it's... Daniel, DIY. DIY, that's right. And then when you get fed up with DIY, you just pay somebody to come in. Because there's some people who would have a go. They're not plumbers, but they'd have a go at plumbing. And that right, John, then they send for you when it all goes pear-shaped. 
And maybe someday have a go at wee bit of plastering or joinery. And well, most of us can have a go at painting, I think, and give that a go. But there are still those, they've reached that stage, they just think, you know, I'll just bring somebody else in to do it. All kinds of things we could maybe do or have a go at, but we let somebody else do it. But there's a, there's a sense of pride when you can do it yourself. Isn't that right? There's something in being able to say, if you see that beautiful bungalow on the Duke Road, I built that myself with these hands. Now, that's a fiction. I'm not telling you that I built it. <laughs> it's not likely to happen anytime soon. But there is a sense of achievement, and, and, and I, the boy, I built that, or I did that, or some beautiful piece of furniture, I made that myself. Well, whenever I thought about all those wee things we've just been talking about, and how we can work hard, and then we can sit back and think, I did that. It makes me think of a verse in the Bible, I'm sure you know it, and there we are. And it's Ephesians 2. And it says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Not of yourselves, not of works. It's a gift of God. You see, what God did for us was a work that we couldn't do for ourselves. But there's a lot of people out there who don't know that. They think that by being a decent person and, and, and even being a good, hard-working employee or business person and by paying taxes and doing everything right, that that's all we need to do in this life and that God will see that and he'll say, what a decent, good, neighborly, charitable person that is. Sure, they've done nothing wrong. They'll be able to get into my heaven. Loads and loads of people think that, boys and girls. But you see all those things I've just mentioned, the hard work and being decent and paying your taxes and paying your bills, and pay, that's all good works. But the work that had to be done to get you and me into heaven was a work that nobody in this world could do. And it took somebody from heaven to come into this world to do it. And his name is Jesus. Jesus said this in John 17, speaking to his father in prayer, and he says, I have glorified you in the earth. I finished the work you gave me to do. Does any boy or girl know what work Jesus did that was so important and only ever was done once by him? Very important work that Jesus did. What did he do? Yes, Alice again. He died on the cross. That's the right answer. I couldn't die for you because I've got sin of my own. And Jesus is the only one who had no sin and he could take your sin and mine. What an amazing work he did. So there's no point in us trying to pat ourselves in the back. Oh, I did this, I did that, Lord. I'm good enough, Lord. I'm better than the next person, Lord. Because these works of ours don't count. We couldn't do the one work that does count. And Jesus had to do that. For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. But isn't it great that it's a gift? It's a gift. And yet there are people today and they haven't received and accepted that free gift. I wonder are you one of them, boys and girls? This could be the day when you trust in Jesus and you do it simply by believing, by faith. And you get his gift of eternal life. May the Lord bless these wee thoughts to your hearts for his name's sake. We're going to sing again. And it's seek ye first the kingdom of God and we'll stand while we sing.
We're turning this morning to the book of Psalms and Psalm 73. Psalm 73, a psalm of Asaph. And it begins with a declaration. And this is often the conclusion of the psalmist's reasonings. And uh, sometimes they, they give us this before they go into all the thought process that they went through before they arrived at this conclusion. So there might be a couple of other conclusions that differ from this as we read through the psalm, but this is the ultimate one. This is the statement that he wants to make to draw us in. And it is in verse 1. Truly, God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. Truly. Or it might be saying, I have discovered this. It's a fact. I can stand over this. God is good to Israel. God's good to his people. And although we might question it at times, and perhaps the psalmist questioned it, he certainly did as we go on to see, he is good to those who are living pure lives. Truly God is good to Israel. Now he could have just said, truly God is good and left it there. And maybe you're thinking that he should have done so. Because to say truly God is good to Israel could be seen as a wee bit uh, exclusive or limiting. Whereas to leave Israel out of it, just to say truly God is good, is more inclusive and we can make it apply to nearly anything and anyone. But I think there's a reason why uh, the psalmist is limiting himself to one example when he says that. And of course it's because of the uniqueness of Israel as a nation. I believe here when he says Israel, he's meaning the uh, umbrella term for the 12 tribes of Israel, the descendants of Jacob. So he's talking about the nation as originally called out by God, separated by God unto himself. He's talking about a, a people group that God called out from other nations and, and uh, did so that they might bear his name and show his glory to the surrounding nations. So he's using this overarching collective term that describes a company who have been given promises by God himself. Covenant promises. Promises that God has committed himself to keeping. God will always keep his part of a covenant. And at the same time, God has promised this group that he will, in his dealings with them, show that he is one who's steadfast in his love. He set his love on them. So when the psalmist writes, truly God is good to Israel, he's thinking of God's divine administration, whether it's seen or unseen. God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. Uh, Whenever we add that second little phrase, you have God is good to Israel, such as are of a clean heart. In my mind, it's as if the, uh, the focus changes from using a wide-angle lens, God is good to Israel, right down to using a microscope, even to such as are of a clean heart. From the ethnic group to the individual. And that brings us to verse 2, because here he says, me, my feet, my steps. So he makes this declaration and then he comes right down. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. So a picture is building here. We have Israel with their expectation that their God will keep his promises. Although some of them were conditional upon their behavior as well. And we have the psalmist giving us his personal take on the things that are happening to him. But then in verse 3, we will see the picture gets developed a bit further. Because we have the introduction then of the wicked. We have this wonderful God. We have Israel. We have his dealings with individuals. And then we have the ungodly. 
Now, the ungodly are seen in contrast to Israel. So they were possibly the ungodly nations that surrounded Israel. But of course, there's ungodly seen in contrast to us as individuals as well. God, Israel, the ungodly, and the psalmist. So here's a psalm that describes the attempts of a man trying to make sense of the world. Trying to make sense of of his life in this world. Trying to make sense of God's purposes in this world and therefore the inclusion of Israel. But the problem is the two little words, this world. He's limiting his rationale to the arena of this world. And all of these players that we have just mentioned, they are only seen as performing on the stage of this world. And keep that in mind because as we get to the end, we'll discover that he has a different view as he starts to think these things through before the Lord. So, verse 2 again, As for me, my feet were almost gone, my steps had well nigh slipped. So he didn't always appreciate that truth, that God is good. Because something has happened to him. There's come a time when circumstances clouded his judgment, obscured his vision, and as a result, he started to slip away from spiritual realities. We can get our eyes off spiritual realities, can't we? Simply because things come in to cloud our vision. He has been shaken. He no no longer feels sure-footed. He's wobbling, as we might say. But thankfully, he provides us with a reason. Verse 3. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked or of the ungodly. Now, he's not knocking prosperity or he's not envying desiring prosperity as such. But he may be kind of thinking of those who are prospering through Old Testament patriarchal eyes because the likes of Abraham was blessed materially because at that time that was a sign of God's blessing upon you. In fact, a sign of a righteous life. But it was only limited to a very short period in history. So he may have been looking at things in that way. And then he starts to make comparisons Be careful who you compare yourself with. Because if you want to find somebody worse than you, you probably will find somebody worse than you. Be careful who you make comparisons with. And be careful what value you put on things. If you're here this morning, you profess to be a believer but you don't value your relationship with Jesus, your inheritance in Jesus, then you run the risk of being like Esau, who sold his birthright for a pot of stew. And so many today give up. They get away, and they get far away from God. They no longer value what they have in him. I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And then he goes on to be a wee bit more specific. Verse 4. For there are no bands in their death. Their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men. Neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore pride compasseth them about as a chain. Violence covered them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart could wish. They are corrupt. That literally should be translated. They mock and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore this people return thither. Waters of a full cup are wrung out to them, and they say, How does God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. And as I read through that, what stood out to me was this, 
The psalmist was able to go into so much detail about the ungodly people. And what came to me was this. To be able to do that, he must have been observing them. He must have had his eyes on them. Perhaps he was too much in their company. He certainly has been looking their direction. You've heard the phrase, of course, far off fields look greener. How do we know they look greener? We start to look, don't we? We start to look in that direction. We start to look away. A prodigal son in Jesus' parable went into the far country, but that had to begin with him thinking about the far country, realizing there was a far country, then setting his sights on the far country. And he certainly did not value what he had in the loving home that he was brought up in. He placed all the value on, on what was out there and not on the love that he had in his father's house. So what does the psalmist see when he looks at the ungodly? Verse 6, pride is openly displayed. Verse 7, greed is in their very eyes in spite of all that they already have. Verses 8 to 11, they blaspheme and have no fear of offending God. They have much to say and, and everybody seems to be drinking in their words and believing their propaganda, their worldview. And of course, their worldview doesn't include God. In fact, their worldview is an abomination to the God of heaven. Does that sound familiar to you? The voices that are being heard today, the voices that are shouting the loudest are exactly these voices. And it's possible for the child of God to listen too long and to start to believe. And yet, verses 4 and 5, in spite of all this, they seem to get through life without much trouble, and when they come to die, they appear to have no anxiety about it at all. I'm sure you've noticed, uh, on certainly on uh, morning TV, all the programs are interrupted, one after the other after the other, with some kind of mention of plans for funerals and cremations and all the rest of it. But have you noticed how subtly things are getting in? And you have these characters saying, I don't want a funeral. They're making it look as though they're a burden to society. I don't want to lumber my family with. And if you listen carefully, there's a lot of very subtle things being said. Oh, I want a pure cremation. So deal with the practical bit. And then let our family party in. Do you see the massive change and shift in the whole idea of death today? Subtle, but it's getting in. You're a burden. And on and on it goes. Get this out of the way. Bear your family. Isn't it sad? Life that's unborn is cheap. Life that has been well lived and long lived is cheap. What a disgusting world we live in. And that's where we're at. These people want to portray the fact, what's death? What's death? Well, the psalmist then comes to this conclusion because he's been listening to this too long. He's been watching too long. He's got his eyes off the Lord for too long. And this is what he comes to the conclusion of in verse 13. Verily or truly, I have cleansed my heart in vain. I have washed my hands in innocency. Now, that's a very different conclusion to the one he begins with. So we know the story's going to end well, but this is what he has arrived at at one point in his life. Showing that he hasn't been thinking straight at times. And perhaps his mind was all over the place. You know, that's a tactic of the enemy. I've been there, but it wasn't the Holy Spirit put me in that position. I'm sure you've been there too. Your mind's all over the place. 
Let's look at this level of despair again in verse 13. I have cleansed my heart in vain. I have washed my hands in innocence. What's he talking about? Well, I think a question and answer that we find in another psalm, Psalm 24, will help us to understand the language that he's using here. Because this is what we read in Psalm 24. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? There's the question. Here's the answer. He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. So do you get what he's talking about here? He's thinking to himself, I have put my trust in God. I have tried to walk close to the Lord. And it's as if he's saying, what was it all for? He's frustrated. He appears to have been trying to live right and be right in the sight of God. He appears to have set his heart on righteous living. Put great effort into it. But whatever has happened, and a combination of things, obviously, what he sees in the ungodly, but something else has happened to him too, to be a double whammy, and it has rocked him. And he arrives at this conclusion. This was in vain. This was for nothing. Verse 14. This is what has happened to him alongside his observation of the ungodly. This is what has happened to him. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. The man's tormented. He's stricken. He's plagued. And it's every day when he gets up in the morning, this is waiting for him. This is hanging over him. It won't go away. Let me tell you, there are things in our lives that just won't go away. There's just things in our lives that are, are there. We, we live in a fallen world, and, and we do, and many of one has to get up each morning, and there it is, it's still facing them. He says, look at me. Look what I'm going through. And yet all the while, these ungodly people, they just don't seem to be able to disturbed at all they just seem to go from strength to strength and life goes on and everything falls into their lap and they are God's enemies and here I am supposedly trying my best to trust in God and look at all that has happened to me verse 15 he says and if I speak thus in other words if I were to actually say this out loud to somebody I should offend against the generation of my children. The NIV puts it this way. If I had spoken out like that, I would have betrayed your children or the generation of your children. I think this is interesting. Because it's obvious that this psalm has been written after the psalmist has reached a good place spiritually. But when he was in the throes of frustration and possibly depression, he felt he couldn't speak up. Have you ever felt like that? He didn't want to appear weak. That's really what he was saying. If, if I were to talk like this, it might have an effect on, on those in, in the nation, those around him. He would appear maybe disloyal to his faith or his his ethnic group. He doesn't speak up. Many people today won't talk about what they're going through. They won't speak up. And they have different reasons why. And many feel they can't. And so they fumble along in misery. And that's what we see. We get this in verse 16. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. This is mental torture here. This is heavy. This hurts. But the psalm doesn't end at verse 16. We have an until in verse 17. Until I went into the sanctuary of God. Now, 
we sometimes would rather have a different until. Maybe you were expecting a different until in the psalm. Maybe you were expecting it to read, until God completely healed me, or until God completely delivered me, or until God dealt with all my enemies and took the whole problem away, you might be saying, I thought like that until, and you're talking about some wonderful intervention, even in a miraculous way. But we actually don't read of that. But this is not a disappointing until. This is a very important until. Until I went into the sanctuary of God. Now he's certainly referring to a place here. But it's a place where God is the focus. That's what we need to take from that idea of the sanctuary of God. Whatever you picture in your mind where he may have meant by that. It was certainly a place where God is the focus. His problems haven't gone away, but he makes a good move in the right direction. He heads for a place where the world is shut out and a place where God can be sought. God's presence can be felt. God's word can be heard. God's people can surround him. That sounds a wee bit like what a church should be, doesn't it? Let me ask you this. Those of you who've been through something, I'm sure everybody's been through something, and you've all got things you'll be thinking immediately of because you'll be thinking of the worst thing that you've been through. Was there never a time when you came into the house of God and suddenly God did something? Your problem didn't go, but God did something. Is any wonder we read, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together? Oh, I've experienced it. Coming into the house of the Lord and I started to see things differently. And God has maybe had a word just for me. Oh, it's my prayer that this would be a word just for somebody this morning. What does he go on to say? Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood something. Now, he doesn't understand his own future. doesn't understand how it's going to pan out for him. But one of the problems and stumbling blocks in his relationship with the Lord and going on with God and, and fully trusting God, one of those stumbling blocks was what he was understanding, his misconception of the ungodly. So whatever plagued him and, and had hurt him and, and, and he had to wake up to every day, we don't read of that going, but we do read of him understanding, not his end, but their end. We are in a messed up world today, aren't we? And it seems that wrong triumphs over right. But that's why it's important to come into the house of God because we can then refocus and realize, do you see all these blasphemers and people who do abominable things and alter their laws to go against God and, and, and then alter other laws to persecute the people of God? They aren't in eternity yet. And it's by reading the word of God that we understand their end. Surely, verse 18, thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou castest them down into destruction. How are they brought into desolation as in a moment? They're utterly consumed with terrors. As a dream when one awaketh, so, O Lord, when thou awakest, when thou, awakest thou shalt despise their image. So who are the ones really in the slippery places? the ungodly. You see, the psalmist realizes that though he felt he had slipped and though he felt that he was away from where he would like to be in his confidence in God, there was only so far that he could slip. 
And maybe you're here today, and unknown to us, you're living in a backslidden condition. If you're truly the Lord, there's only so far you can slip. Unlike the ungodly, because there's no limit to their destruction. Down, down, and down eternally. Vast difference. The psalmist felt as though he was losing his footing at times. He was shaky. He wobbled. But there's a problem here. Psalmists realize this. The ungodly don't seem to realize it. They don't want to think about it. And yet their destruction will be sudden, final, and irreparable. Now he's starting to evaluate things spiritually. Friends, this morning, you can't put a value on eternal life. You can't put a value on that. I'm going to ask you a question. I want a good, strong answer. Are you glad you're saved? You can't put a value in that. You have eternal life. You can't put a value on the Lord being with you in life and you being with him after death. You can't put a value in that. You can't put a value on being rightly related to God, the God of heaven, the Almighty, the Eternal One. You can't put a value on salvation, being spared the great white throne judgment. And on top of that, being reached the title deeds of heaven. You know what we're going to be discussing tonight around the Lord's table, if you will? Heaven. Heaven. Verse 21. Thus was my heart grieved, and I was pricked in my reins and my innermost being. So foolish was I, and ignorant. I was as a beast before thee. How could I have been so blind, he says? What was I thinking? Where was my head? Now he condemns his own former folly. He realizes that his conduct has been totally irrational. And he's been really short-sighted. He says, I'm like a stupid animal. Nevertheless, verse 23, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden me by my right hand. Notice that it's God who's holding on to the psalmist. Isn't that precious? It's not the other way around. Because the psalmist has lost his grip on spiritual realities. But God has not lost his grip of the psalmist. What does a slipping, sliding saint need? And I'm glad I got that out because (laughs) I have an ulcer. (laughs) I'll not say it again. I'll not say it again. But what does he need? Somebody to hold his hand. Isn't that right? Somebody to hold his hand. And here it is, verse 23. And what a reach from heaven right down to earth. What a grip he who threw the stars in place and the planets and keeps them there and sustains everything by the word of his power. That's the grip that's holding you whenever you feel wobbly. You can't put a value in that, can you? How can you compare that with what's out there in this world? And it goes on, verse 24. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel and afterward receive me to glory. That's priceless, isn't it? To be guided through this minefield of life and then to be welcomed into the Father's house forever as home. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. Now his focus has changed. Now his focus is right. It's been adjusted. 
It's higher. You know, if this old world was the place where we would expect fairness and we would expect retribution and we would expect vindication, we'll be disappointed. It's not going to happen in this world. There will be certain things God must do during the tribulation in this world. But it will be at the great white throne when everything is sorted out. Every motive of every heart laid bare. Nobody who didn't value the person of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the word of God, the love of God, they'll stand one day ashamed. And those who did trust the Lord fully, even though it led to martyrdom, even though they died in oppression and persecution and other kinds of miseries that come into our lives because we're in a broken world, even though they went out of this world, they went straight into the rest of God. How do you put a value in that? My flesh and my heart faileth. There we have it. And here's a but. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. The Lord said to Paul at one time when he didn't take away Paul's issue, the thorn in the flesh, he said, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. We can be afflicted. We can struggle We can feel our flesh feeling. We can think we're losing our standing. We can wobble and be shaken and all of these things. But God is still our portion and our portion forever. Lo, they that are far from thee shall perish. Thou hast destroyed all them that go whoring from thee, but... It is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all thy works. Quite a simple ending, isn't it? Those who are far lose out. Those who are near, those who are near will know all that God has for them. And better than that, be able to have things to tell others. Isn't it great to be able to testify to the goodness of God in the land? the living. Where are we today? Are we near or far? May the Lord bless these thoughts to your hearts for his name's sake. Our last song is a lovely one. All the way my Savior leads me and we'll stand as we sing.
Father, what we have this morning in you is priceless. We can't put a value on it. Help us never to trade these priceless, precious things for anything less that this world has to offer. Lord, speak on, we pray. Bless us, we pray. Lift up those who are shaky this morning. May they realize and may they even sense the grip of a mighty God in whose name we pray. Amen.